so thank you everyone for coming to tonight's uh, book talk. Uh, so tonight it's an honor actually uh, to welcome Professor Zhang Changdong uh, from uh, PKU. Uh, professor Zhang is a professor and chair of the Department of Political Science at PKU. Uh, and he received his PhD in Political Science from the University of Washington in Seattle. Okay. Uh, his research interests include taxation politics, fiscal sociology, uh, state and society relationships, and institutionalism. You know, his papers have appeared in China Quarterly, The China Review, uh, and other journals. And of course, he has published a book, uh, the book we are discussing today, entitled Governing and Ruling, uh, The Political Logic of Taxation in China. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let me uh, invite Professor Zhang uh, to tell us more about this book. Professor Zhang, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Ben. Uh, thank you for your kindly invitation. Uh, and also thank uh, Angela for your comments. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm very honored uh, and very glad to have the opportunity to uh, share my book, I mean, which is uh, almost a year ago uh, with you. And, uh, uh, I'm, uh, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, get feedback, comments, and uh, critics from you. Okay, so I, now I will share the screen. Okay, so, uh, so today's topic is on uh, uh, the book, uh, which uh, titled as Governing and Ruling. Uh, and uh, I uh, changed the subtitle in the last minute. So uh, the subtitle used to be Taxation and uh, Authoritarian Resilience uh, until uh, one of my colleagues told me that uh, uh, it's better not to have authoritarian uh, at the cover. And then I changed the title to the current one, uh, which is the uh, uh, political logic of taxation in China. Uh, and it has uh, seven chapters uh, plus the, the introduction. Uh, so I, I know it's like, a, uh, it's, it's kind of like a very challenging for me to go through all of the, all, all of the chapters like within an hour. But uh, so I will uh, have some emphasize some topics and then briefly mention some others. Uh, so uh, the book starts from a uh, theoretical discussion on authoritarian resilience and then introduce a theory of physical sociology of authoritarian resilience. And then chapter two kind of like lays out the background, the institutional background, which is the tax state transition. Uh, I will elaborate three dimensions of uh, this state uh, tax state transition later. Uh, chapter three and chapter four uh, are about uh, the governing story. So there's governing and there's ruling. So it's mostly about uh, how uh, this tax state transition helps uh, regional economic development and what kind of mechanisms are under this transition and the development. Chapter five is about uh, uh, represent representation and taxation. So it's basically examines the uh, uh, relationship between paying taxes, especially the private entrepreneurs uh, paying taxes and, uh, the, and uh, their participation in local people's Congress. Uh, chapter six, uh, this could be most relevant to uh, colleagues in uh, the law school. So this is a uh, rule by fear and uh, it discusses how the taxation system is related to government business relationship. And then I drew a conclusion and I do some uh, comparisons, uh, both historical comparison and uh, international uh, comparison. Okay, so the main puzzle for the book is, uh, so this is like a very uh, classic uh, topic in comparative, comparative politics. So why regimes could be sustained in some countries, but not, not others. Why? Because in uh, in 90, uh, 1990s and 2000s, the most important topic in comparative politics is uh, democratization. So democratization means uh, some non-democratic countries, like uh, they are called as either authoritarian regimes or totalitarian regimes, why they collapsed and then transited to democracy. But then uh, people, and the scholars realize that uh, uh, not all the countries get democ democratized. And some countries, they get democratized, then they come back to uh, authoritarianism. Okay, so uh, in the last decade, uh, 
more and more scholars just uh, started to focus on another side of the coin. It's not democratization, it's uh, Western country democracies. They interested the Western countries don't go democratize. All right, so, uh, and uh, it is, so for China, it's, it's even more interesting because uh, for many other countries, uh, including the uh, former communist, communist countries, when they experienced market transition, then, uh, or even not, and for Latin American countries, it's not even not a market transition, it's about their uh, neoliberal reform, like the readjustment program. They, the authoritarian regimes collapsed and get democratized. So, but in China, uh, we have, have experienced a market transition associated with a tax data transition and also with 40 years of very rapid economic growth. So all of these transitions and economic development predict democratization in theory and actually in, uh, uh, in many other countries. But why no democratization happened in China? So this is a puzzle and many scholars try to explain this. And uh, uh, it's uh, important to define what a regime resilience uh, means. So regime resili resilience uh, differs from regime survival. So survival is kind of like a minimum requirement. It's uh, simply a matter of maintaining power. Uh, but resilience requires much more. So it's first you need to survive. But then it requires you need to uh, thrive and adapt while forcing economic growth and uh, also uh, growth of national military, right? So in Chinese, it's like Fu Guo Chang Bin, right? So, uh, and they remain unchallenged authority during periods of significant social and economic change. So here, so a significant uh, social and economic change uh, refers market transition and uh, tech state transition. Okay, so to uh, to borrow what uh, Machiavelli said centuries ago is that a ruler, a king, needed to be loved as well as be feared. Right. So lo be loved means you governing well, well, and be feared means like you are able to rule it. So I get the I got the uh, the title. Uh, when I read this book, ruling but not governing, so it's kind of like a study in uh, of uh, Middle East, and the title is ruling but not governing. So I think I, I find that a uh, successful authoritarian regime can do both ruling and governing. Okay, so my argument in brief is that uh, the taxation system plays a very important role in resolving autocratic governance problems and dilemmas, and therefore can contribute to uh, regime resilience uh, through uh, different mechanisms, which I will elaborate uh, in details later. Okay, so before I uh, turn to my argument, and um, uh, I will first have a quick literature review and uh, see how my argument and my explanation contributes to the uh, recent literature. So there are two sets of literatures I need to engage and debate with. The first is the institutional turn of authoritarian resilience. So which actually uh, authoritarian resilience is a dependent variable, right? So there are many other independent variables other scholars have used. So I, I'll tell you like how my argument differs from theirs. And the taxation, of course, is my independent variable. And there, uh, also some research have been done on this topic. So I will also tell you like how my book differs from this uh, uh, research. Okay, so institutional turn of authoritarian resilience, as I just mentioned, uh, uh, actually uh, it doesn't replace, but it's kind of like it became more and more important uh, in the last decade uh, and even more productive uh, than the theory of democratization in the last decade. And therefore, some scholars call this like institutional turn. Okay, so uh, try scholars try to explain authoritarian resilience by focusing on different kinds of institutions. Okay, so the uh, the traditional explanation focuses on coercive, right? So it's like coercive and the security institutions. Uh, by definition, 
authoritarianism means that uh, you rule through coercive and terror, right? Uh, so that's why there are so many literature on uh, coercive and security institutions and their function of repression. Uh, and uh, related to China studies, uh, some scholars say we are also they will also study the uh, stability maintenance system by Wei Wen teacher. So this stability maintenance system is related and backed up by uh, these coercive and security institutions. And some scholars they also use uh, judiciary systems, but the judiciary system is not only coercive; it's also like a cooperative. Uh, it has much more functions. But the the critic for using repression is that uh, uh, repression uh, has many defects and uh, uh, backlashes, right? So if you use repression, then uh, some the enemies will become more radicalized, and the part of your alliances will uh, go natural, or they will be your enemies. And also, repression is very costly, uh, costly, uh, and uh, for me, repression. In, uh, maybe leads to people uh, in, increase or strengthen social control, but it weakens uh, people's cooperation. So people wouldn't make many investment, therefore the economic may stagnate. So this kind of uh, so it has uh, so it's important. Although it's very very important, but it also has many limitations. Therefore, it's not an ideal way to maintain the regime. And in the last uh, uh, actually last two decades. Uh, more and more scholars uh, started to focus on uh, this, what they call as democratic looking institutions, like the legislature, party, and election. And they believe that these institutions play a very important role of co-optation. Okay, so, uh, and this theory can, uh, is also applied to uh, study of Chinese politics. So for example, uh, Professor Yan Xiaojun at Hong Kong U uh, uh, Department of Politics and Public Administration. Uh, so he published uh, many papers on how uh, the democratic looking institution, especially the uh, the uh, political consultant conference, Zheng uh, Xie, played such a role in maintaining the regime. Uh, and I will also, uh, I mean, it's, and it's, so scholars uh, also provide many critiques for this set of literature, uh, cooperation itself is not in, uh, is is not enough, and also as I will elaborate late, uh, in details later, this only plays as a, a shallow explanation, not a deeper exp explanation. So the the the, uh, the real question is why the uh, uh, why the resource rich people like the private entrepreneurs uh, why do they want to be a member of legislature? Okay, so we need to go through, uh, go deeper, uh, and uh, figure out what are the real mechanisms. And there are also some other explanations, like the selectoral system, uh, authoritarian welfare state, and uh, also the propaganda and the censorship. So I, I think I don't, I don't have enough time to uh, provide uh, more details about this. But uh, uh, in the book, I also. Have a, uh, have a review and uh, some critiques of these different ex explanations. Okay, so uh, and so these theories they are very important and they explain many important aspects of authoritarian uh, regime. Uh, here, theoretically, there are some other uh, critiques. So one is uh, there's a paradoxes, right? Uh, so repression, cooperation, providing social welfare, doing censorship, all of these are very expensive, right? So not all the countries can afford this kind of programs. Uh, and only a country with sufficient physical revenue can do that, right? Then the question is, so where the money comes from? And to borrow a very uh, famous sentence, uh, I mean, it, it, it is said that I mean, uh, I heard that it's it's uh, what Zhou Yongkang said, right? So Zhou Yongkang's uh, very famous word is, uh, if we can solve the problem using RMB, then this is uh, not a problem between people and the enemy, right? So so uh, So it's like uh, uh, it's not 
uh, within the people means like they are not going to take our uh, regime, right? So, uh, but then the question is where the money comes from. Uh, another critique uh, actually uh, is provided provided by uh, some other scholars is that uh, the institutional turn of authoritarian resilience, they lack very uh, good institutional theories uh, to explain uh, many, mostly they focus, they rely on this very functionalism, uh, functionalist institutional explanation. Uh, but we needed to go a, a step further to uh, provide a better explanation, and especially to deal with the Indo uh, endogenous problem. Okay, so uh, so in this book, I also try to deal with that by uh, using more sophisticated version of institutional theory uh, to deal with uh, these challenges. Okay, so this is about uh, the uh, institutional turn of authoritarian resilience. Okay, so on the other hand, uh, so I'm arguing that taxation is important. Uh, and then when I started to work on the book, and uh, I started to read more and more literature, and I find okay, so there are uh, so taxation is regarded as uh, a very important topic in politics that uh, doesn't uh, does, doesn't get enough attention in academics. Uh, so this is especially true uh, ten years ago, but nowadays there are more and more studies on taxation, and there I find okay, so there are very important. Uh, research have been done on this topic. Uh, and uh, I try to figure out, okay, so how can I make a different argument than uh, the exi existing ones? So for example, when I read this paper by Slater and uh, Fender, I was very frustrated because at that time I thought uh, there's nothing new left in my argument. Okay, so, uh, so basically they rely on the taxation regime and uh, uh, influence structural power. So which uh, influence structural power is also uh, very similar to the concept of state capacity. Okay, so they have uh, these different mechanisms that how taxation regimes uh, are important for authoritarian resilience. So I use this figure to elaborate. So it's taxation capacity means state capacity. So if you have stronger taxation capacity, it means you have stronger state capacity and then a strong uh, authoritarian regime are more resilient than others. Okay, so I uh, struggled with myself for months and then I found, okay, so there's some uh, a breakaway I can make. Uh, okay, so but before introducing uh, what's uh, what I found, uh, I will uh, cite some uh, paragraphs on uh, Joseph Schumpeter uh, and others to convince you that uh, taxation is a very very important explanation for authoritarian resilience. Okay, so about a hundred years ago, uh, Schumpeter, right? Every, everybody knows who Schumpeter is. So he has this very famous uh, paper, the crisis of the tax state, and and in this paper, this paper kind of like uh, uh, started the uh, tradition of physical sociology. And in the article, he said that uh, it has both causal importance and uh, important uh, significances in today's world. It's, it's as an independent variable, it's important. As a dependent variable, it's also very, very important. Okay, so, uh, and for me, I used it as independent variable, which is neglected by uh, many scholars. Okay, so this is Sumbiter. And uh, Max Weber also uh, a lot extensively on uh, taxation, and especially taxation and uh, bureaucracy. Okay, then I try to find out some, uh, something new I can contribute, and I find that uh, uh, for authoritarian regimes, uh, taxation is important, uh, as in democracies, but uh, there are two unique dilemmas for authoritarians. Okay, so one, so one important dilemma is the gross dilemma. Uh, and the second is the representation dilemma. So I will uh, discuss one by one below. Okay, so the gross dilemma. 
So this is associated with uh, Douglas North and his uh, new institutional theory, right? So for North, uh, the state, on the one hand, it wants to maximize revenue, tax revenue. And on the other hand, it wants uh, economic growth. Right, so he claims that the state uh, is the solution, but at the same time also the problem of economic growth. And therefore, the key challenge is to constrain the state of power. Right? And he uh, wrote many papers and books trying to find out how uh, the state of power can be constrained. Uh, okay, so, uh, and here we come back. So, and for, for the Chinese Communist Party, uh, it faces this same dilemma, right? So on the one hand, it wants uh, rapid economic growth uh, as a source for its performance legitimacy, right? So uh, we can notice that uh, in many years, uh, the party and the central government emphasized that this year, the GDP growth rate will be higher than 8%. And then later on, it's 6 percent, uh, uh, right? But uh, this kind of like is very, very important uh, because people believe that the party is right, because uh, mostly because it promotes economic growth and uh, improve uh, social welfare. But at the same time, it also wants to maximize its revenue. Right? Without the revenue, the government cannot function. Uh, so this, uh, and we can also see many evidences, including uh, the re Li Keqiang's recent tour to Shenzhen, right? So he asked the uh, coast provinces to submit enough revenue to the central government uh, uh, when, the, when the state has very, very strict uh, uh, zero COVID policy, right? So it's kind of like a, uh, there's a dilemma. So you want economic growth and you want revenue growth. Uh, and this figure kind of like uh, uh, tells us what happened in the last uh, uh, 40 years, right? So, uh, so we get the nominal GDP growth rate, real GDP growth rate, and the national tax uh, growth rate. So what we can see is uh, before and after the tax year reform in uh, 1994, uh, this trend has been changed. So especially if we look at the real GDP growth rate and national tax growth rate, before 1994, uh, real GDP growth rate is higher than national tax growth rate. But after that, uh, tax growth rate became higher than economic growth, uh, GDP growth rate, right? So, uh, and this, uh, especially in the last uh, five years and a decade, uh, more and more scholars started to criticize the government for taxing too much. Okay, so that's the uh, first uh, dilemma. And the second dilemma is the uh, representation dilemma. Uh, so uh, taxation is a, a kind of the foundation for states' infrastructural power, right? So uh, I'm not going to read the definitions here, uh, but in under authoritarian regimes, to improve infrastructural power, including to improve your tech, uh, to uh, to collect collect more tax revenue, may, may means that it will weaken the despotic power of the state. Right. So if uh, and to to borrow Michael Mann's word, when the state penetrates the, into the society to extract more revenue. The state also penetrates into the sta state. So how does the society penetrates into the state? According to Michael Mann and other scholars, uh, to their observation of uh, Western European history, the state and uh, the society penetrates into the state uh, in many different ways. But the most important way is through representation in, uh, in the leg legislature. Okay, so if you want to get a text from me, uh, you need hear my voice, right? How the money is used. Uh, so this is this very, very famous, uh, no taxation, no represent, uh, without representation slogan uh, argues, right? So, so this dilemma is, so if more and more tax revenue is collected by the state, then there, will, there could be more demand for representation and uh, to constrain the state power. Okay, so, uh, in democracies, uh, it's easy to understand, right? Because uh, you can 
you can try to uh, text more, and but then uh, you need it, it needs to go through the legislature. But how about uh, a non-democratic regime? And uh, there are some very interesting theories regarding to uh, regarding to this taxation representation linkage. And one important theory is this uh, quasi voluntary compliance theory proposed by uh, Marguerite Levy. And she argues that uh, uh, to reduce the cost of compliance, uh, the, uh, the quasi voluntary compliance should be achieved. And it on could only be achieved when taxpayers have confidence that uh, uh, rulers will keep their bargains and the other constituents will keep theirs. So, for the first, the rulers will keep their bargains. So it, it means uh, the government will do what they promise to do, right? And uh, the other constituents will keep theirs. It's, it's like, the, it, uh, it means like, uh, so I know I'm paying the taxes and I want to make sure my colleagues, my friends and other people I know or I don't know, they are also paying their taxes honestly. Right. Otherwise, if others are cheating, why should why should I be very honest? So this uh, so this is kind of like a, a one way to to improve uh, to reduce compliance cost and improve tax uh, compliance. Okay, so with these uh, ideas in mind, right? So one first, it's important to improve taxation capacity uh, to maintain power, but then. For the authoritarian rules to improve taxation capacity, and at the same time, you need also to keep economic, economic the economy growing. And with and the second, without uh, more demand for representation and the political participation. And then, how can uh, a country like China uh, achieve these three goals at the same time? So uh, I argue that there are three uh, there are three characteristics of the tech state, Chinese tech state, that somehow play uh, 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 they work together and uh, try uh, they could achieve these three goals at the same time, at least for the last forty years. Uh, I'm not sure whether they will work again, uh, work for the next 40 years, but for the last 40 years so far, they are kind of like successful. The first mechanism or first characteristic of the Chinese tax state is it has a de facto fiscal federalism. It's not a fiscal, not a real fiscal uh, federalism, but it's uh, kind of like uh, I will discuss what it, it means. And then it is a half tax state, uh, and thirdly. The tax administration, tax administration is under institutionalized. Okay, so I will spend uh, the last thirty minutes on these three uh, different mechanisms. Okay, uh, and uh, but uh, before I come to the details, I will briefly introduce my research design. So it's a mixed methods research design. Uh, first, I try I take China as a, a case, but uh, of course. Uh, as we, uh, the comp in comparative parties in the last two or three decades, uh, there is a trend of a subnational turn. So we used to compare a country with another country or another countries, but nowadays uh, people realize it could be very uh, fluid for to uh, do subnational comparison, like compare uh, Zhejiang with Jiangsu or kind of that, or even uh, com compare a country with another country. And that's what I'm trying to do. And I also do uh, in-depth case study, so I will rely heavily on uh, one case, uh, one county, uh, by uh, by studying the archives and talking to people. And I do some uh, case, uh, compar comparative case studies uh, use, uh, using both method of agreement and method of difference. And uh, uh, many people create uh, asked me, okay, so China has about 3,000 counties, and you only go to like uh, seven of them. So how can you tell this is uh, what's happening in China? Okay, and then I also do some quantitative study. So I uh, I find some uh, existing survey data, and I, and I worked with research assistant to collect the county level data and combine that together and to, uh, to test uh, whether my 
uh, hypothesis or my conclusions finding in these cases uh, can, can be generalized. So I rely on field work, archives, the secondary data and the survey data to do my research. Okay, now I go to the first, uh, the first uh, uh, mechanism, which is this uh, physical federalism. Okay, so, uh, and I, with a focus on how this physical federalism influence the process of bureaucratization and therefore improve uh, governance quality and uh, promote economic growth at the same time. Okay, so for the fiscal system, uh, so in China, uh, for People's Republic of China, uh, broadly, uh, we can say there are three different economic systems in the uh, MPRC's history. Uh, of course, you can find there are many uh, within uh, many differences within each system, uh, especially before uh, 1980s. But uh, briefly speaking, uh, before reform and op opening up, uh, in China we has uh, the Ch Chinese government developed this uh, planned economy. Uh, it's underdeveloped planned economy, right? So some scholars call it as M economy, uh, 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 including Chen Yi and his colleagues. And associated with this planned economy is a communist tech state, uh, and uh, with unitary remittance and unitary expenditure. Uh, in Chinese, it's tong shou tong zhi. Uh, so basically, taxation was not very important at that time because most of the enterprises, if not all of the enterprises, belonged to the states, state, right? Uh, belonged to all different levels of government. So there's no separation between government and uh, enterprise. So therefore, taxation is not was not very important. But still, there are uh, a, a very limited number of enterprises and also some collective enterprises. So there was the uh, taxes. Uh, and a communist tax state, I borrow this concept from uh, even Lieberman. Uh, so it says that the state does not need to tax the society because the state directly earns the enterprises and uh, the means of production. Okay, so that's the before the reform. And in the early stage of reform, uh, we got a partially liberalized market and uh, very rapidly de development of township and the village enterprises. Right? So the planned co economy uh, was uh, uh, kind of like uh, it was partially destroyed, I mean, in an incremental way. And then for the uh, tech state, what kind of tech state is associated with it? So I call this as a feudal state. Uh, because we have the fiscal contracting system uh, and uh, tax farming, very ramp very rampant, rampant actual budgetary uh, fund management. So briefly speaking, at that time, for each level of government, they, they will sign a contract with uh, their supervisors and uh, also uh, their, their agents. For example, for a province government, uh, say like uh, uh, Zhejiang, so Zhejiang province government will sign a contract with the central government. It will say that, okay, so for this year, we will submit this amount of tax revenue to you. And uh, for the next year, we will submit uh, this amount plus 10% increase uh, to the central government. For the rest of the revenue we collect, we can keep them for our expenditure, or we can keep it 90% uh, for our expenditure. And the Zhejiang province will sign a contract with Hangzhou, and Hangzhou will sign a contract with, uh, I mean, many contracts with uh, the counties and districts under it. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like, I call this is a, a modern tax farming system, right? So this lo looks like a tax farming system, but uh, the difference is uh, in traditional tax, tax farming, uh, the, go the government, Sign a uh, uh, recruit an individual to do that. But here, uh, the government work with government. The government works as tax farmer. Uh, and then, uh, after the tax sharing reform in 1994, uh, China is building a socialist market economy. Right? Uh, this is different from a free market economy. Uh, some scholars call it state capitalism. So basically. Uh, 
state-owned enterprises still played an important role. The government intervened very uh, intensively and so on. And I call the, I call the tax state associated with it as a half tax state. And actually I borrow this uh, concept from uh, Professor Ma Jun, who was uh, a professor at uh, Zhongshan University and now the president of uh, Beijing Shifan Dashue. Uh, so, and mostly because the, uh, the Chinese government rely very heavily on non-tax revenue and indirect uh, revenue. So I will elaborate it in details. Okay, so uh, from the, uh, so when the Chinese economy transited from a planned economy to a socialist market economy, what happened? And what happened to the tax, tax system and uh, therefore to uh, the bureaucracy at the county level and the economic growth associated with that? Okay, so uh, yeah, so in different, so in the fiscal contracting uh, period, uh, there are more and more township and village enterprises rising, uh, and uh, the different levels of government they rely very heavily on TVEs for their revenue. So there are abundant study on research on this topic. Uh, so, but at the same way, because the, bureau, the bureaucracy or the government, government bureaucracy was deeply associated with these enterprises and rely on these enterprises for revenue. So the bureaucracy is not real bureaucracy, right? So they are, uh, as uh, Jing Oyi argues, they are local state corporate, uh, it's a local state corporatism. But for Jing, Jing Oyi and others, they mostly focus on the enterprise side, not on the bureaucracy side. So for me, I try to study how this uh, influences the bureaucracy and uh, uh, how it uh, reduce, uh, kind of like uh, weakens the bureaucracy system. And then after the tax year uniform, most TVEs, if not all of them, get privatized. And there are more and more uh, regional competition. And local government changed their policy uh, of economic development from running TVEs to uh, investment recruitment. And then they find that it's very, very important uh, for them to improve what nowadays what we call as the business environment. Uh, at that time, they call it like uh, the investment friendly environment and so, uh, kind of that. And, and the local leaders, they realized it's very important to discipline their predatory bureaucracy. Okay, so I, uh, so Yuan Yuan Ang from uh, University of Michigan in her very famous book, uh, kind of like a, a Build, uh, build like one one of this co evolutional theory, and for me, I find that uh, uh, the story is kind of like incomplete and lacks a very important dynamic, and therefore I try to uh, kind of like revise the theory to provide uh, uh, some new insights. And for me, one very important uh, one very important dimension for bureaucracy or bureaucratization is to cut off uh, its uh, revenue. Uh, to separate its pri uh, private benefits uh, from public office, right? So this is one uh, one uh, definition, uh, one element of uh, Max Weber's definition of uh, bureaucracy, but uh, uh, mostly neglected by uh, many uh, scholars. Uh, so as Zhang Zemin uh, mentioned uh, years ago, when uh, right after he his retirement, uh, so he. Uh, 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 when he mentions about mentioned about his contribution to the country, uh, he mentioned, okay, so I made three uh, con contributions, and plus uh, another contribution is that I cut off the uh, uh, the the military from running and running businesses, and this is very fatal for the for the military. And the same logic actually applies to the bureaucracy, according Weber. Okay, so. Uh, so I summarize uh, Weber's uh, uh, theory of bureaucratization in uh, three dimensions, physical, functional, and personal. So I will, I, here I focus on the physical dimension. And, uh, okay, let me check the time. And as we can see is that uh, in different uh, period, uh, the bureaucracy has different characteristics, right? So uh, before the reform, 
it looks like a bureaucracy. Uh, uh, and it, uh, because, but it has limited revenue. And then in the first stage of reform, uh, under the fiscal contracting system, the bureaucracy degenerated because uh, or, or uh, a cycle is refeudalized because the, gar uh, the government or the bureaucracy relied very heavily on uh, revenues they produced by themselves. And then uh, in late, since late 1990s, there's, uh, there's a comprehensive reform to separate the bureaucracy from uh, feeding themselves by uh, running enterprises and charging too much from the society. Okay, so, uh, and I, I put this story uh, under, uh, within the process tracing of a county, uh, which in the book I call as uh, County uh, One River, uh, through uh, process tracing. So, uh, okay, so I, let me see how many minutes. Okay, so I will spend like three or five minutes. Uh, so in that chapter, I try to make an argument that, uh, okay, so in different stages, so here stage one, stage two actually uh, is, like similar to these two stages. Uh, in, in the county, what we find is that uh, the county's industry uh, uh, changed from agriculture to light industries. And then the asset mobility associated with, with the industry uh, was very, very low at the beginning because agriculture has barely had, has no uh, mobility. And then uh, the mobility became higher and higher. Uh, because light industries uh, have a high mobility. And, and also this is also because of the government's deregulation. As a result, or uh, related to that, uh, uh, the government development strategy also changes. So in the early stage, the strategy is to monopolize the market and build its, uh, 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 TVEs, right? Uh, and also at the same time set tax market barriers for different, for other regions. At that time, the private entrepreneurs, they have barely have no bargaining power. Okay. They have no bar uh, bargaining power or a limited bargaining power. Uh, therefore, related to that, the bureaucracy associated with that, with that is kind of like feudalism and patrimonialism. It's not like a, a, what it's different from bureaucracy, according to Weber. But in the late, st uh, late stage, uh, when asset mobility becomes high, the local government realized uh, TVs are losing money, right? So their strategy is, uh, as I just mentioned, investment recruitment. On the one hand, they want to keep the capital within the, their jurisdiction, but at the same time, they want to invite outside investment by uh, generating a good business environment. And one important way they needed to do is to uh, discipline their very predatory bureaucracy. So to set many constraints with the bureaucracy to separate the bureaucracy from making money by themselves and so on. So I find I found many very, very interesting document, uh, documents in the archives. And then I also talked to some government officers to uh, close validate that. And many of them are, were retired at that time. Uh, so the private entrepreneurs, they get a more higher bargaining power. Uh, uh, one, one way, so one is they can fault, uh, they can use, uh, they can ag simply exit, right? If this county takes them too much, they will go move to another county. If this province takes them too much, they will move to another province. Uh, and another way they uh, bargaining with government is they became members of local people's congress and they can directly uh, make some uh, requirement. And this was uh, exceptionally true in uh, 1990s when the party secretary empowered the county's people's congress to do some crit critics for the bureaucracies. So there are many uh, documents showing uh, the whole process, like what are the, uh, the, uh, the People's Congress deputies say about the bureaucracy and what the bureaucracy hates responded to them. Right? So it's kind of like very, very uh, exceptional because uh, we can see that uh, later. Uh, this is a very active uh, People's Congress later. 
And all of this helps the emergence of a modern bureaucracy uh, described by Weber. Okay, I'm not going to go say the third stage. Uh, okay, therefore I somehow build my own co-evolutional model, uh, try to uh, kind of like revise and complement it to uh, Yuan Yuan-An's model. So it started from physical decentralization and then the bureaucracy degenerated. Uh, but this, it, it has both negative and positive effects, right? So positively speaking, it helped to uh, the emergence of more and more uh, TVEs and economic growth. But at the same time, it's bad because there's bank, uh, there are rent seeking, there are uh, dis uh, there are, uh, there's degeneralized de bureaucracy. And then uh, with the tax year reform, many TVEs get privatized and asset mobility is rising. And then the local government leaders say motivated to improve bureaucratization. Uh, and then they did a lot of efforts to try to do that. And in some, in some regions, they succeed. In some other regions, they didn't. And then there's the rise of a mutual market. So there's like a, a mutual transformation between the market and the bureaucracy. Uh, so uh, yeah, maybe I can speak too quick and uh, it's difficult to uh, to follow. Uh, okay, then uh, in chapter four, I do this uh, regional, uh, I, I do this uh, 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 comparative case studies and uh, try to identify there's a causal relationship between SA mobility and the governance qualities. Uh, and I also try to figure out the causal mechanisms. Uh, okay, so I have uh, pro two primary cases to compare, and so which with the same economic development level and uh, different industry, uh, different asset mobility, and they are associated with different kind of governance quality. And I further extend uh, the a compar comparison to another five complementary counties and find the similar results. And then I do the quantitative study. Okay, so I also discussed the uh, theoretical implication for that uh, and tries to uh, uh, complement to the existing literature on like uh, the local state corporatism, the market preserve federalism and so on. Okay, so I spent too much time on the first mechanism. Uh, okay, so the, the second one, the second, second characteristic for China's tax state is it is a half tax state. Okay, so uh, by half tax state, it means the government relies very heavily on indirect taxes. So about two thirds of the tax revenue comes from indirect taxes. It's mostly from the value added taxes. And it relies very heavily on state-owned enterprises. So according to uh, statistics, about one third of the uh, physical revenue, uh, of tax revenue comes from the SOEs. And also it relies very heavily on non-tax revenue. Okay, so the non-tax revenue, including social security fund, lender related revenue, uh, especially the land transfer fee and other fees and fines. According to some statistics, I mean, uh, some estimation. So uh, non-tax revenue could account for uh, range from 10% to 20% uh, of GDP. Okay, so tax revenue composes 20% uh, of GDP and uh, non-tax revenue composes, uh, I mean, according to different estimation, uh, at least 10%, but the maximum estimation is like 20%. So it's kind of like uh, uh, almost half of the fiscal revenue is non-tax revenue. Okay, so, uh, so this half tax state uh, will elaborate uh, what this, uh, this uh, picture means, right? So this picture is basically like the, the art of plucking the goose, right? So uh, tech, tech station, the art of taxation is you plunk, plunk the goose without uh, making the goose cry, right? So that's kind of like uh, you tax the people and the people don't realize they are taxed. So this, uh, so I 
I did I didn't do I didn't uh, so in the book uh, I don't have a, a chapter for this, uh, but I but I'm do working on two papers uh, try to find uh, try to find out the uh, mechanisms how this half tech state uh, reduce people's test consciousness. Okay, so one I, I, have, I have just finished one and I'm working on the second. So, but basically, what what we can see is that. Uh, uh, According to a survey for the urban Chinese citizens, uh, people have very low tax uh, consciousness. So most people, like more than half, reported that they don't know their tax burden and they don't know like whether it's fair or not. And uh, uh, lots of people say it's very hard to tell, right? So only uh, like uh, less than seven percent of people report it's too high, right? Uh, uh, so less than 10% of people think the taxation system is unfair. Why? In reality, the taxation, the taxation system in China is unfair. Right? And this is uh, the tax, how it is, how their tax perception compared to the public services received. Uh, again, uh, a, little, uh, a, a little more people believe that they are paying too high. So this is uh, nine, 0.7 percent, right? Uh, compared to uh, six, uh, less than seven percent. So, but still, most people believe that uh, uh, the, the, the taxation and the public service system are fair, uh, but in reality, it's not. Okay, so therefore, the half tax state is good for the regime because uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't improve people's tax consciousness. Therefore, it doesn't elicit people's demand for representation, right? So if you think you're paying lots of tax, then you want make voices. But if you don't feel it, uh, or if you feel it's fair, then you don't want to uh, make any trouble with the regime. So it's good for the regime because it, it improves the state autonomy. Uh, but it also has the negative effects, especially uh, it's inefficient. So relying on land, uh, real estate industry and relying on SOEs, they are inefficient. And they also generate very high inequality, leads to lots of corruptions, right? So therefore, and, and nowadays, I think especially in the recent uh, two or three years, we are uh, find more and more evidences of these negative effects. Uh, so, the, and this is the paper uh, we are working on how uh, the tough tax state influence people's tax consciousness. Okay, the third and the last mechanism uh, is the under-institutionalized tax administration. Okay, so uh, by under-institutionalized tax administration, uh, I mean, uh, first, the tax rate or the nominal tax rate in China is very, very high, right? Uh, so it's like a, uh, it, uh, it in, uh, if we do international comparison, then we find the, the tax rate in China is high, uh, or the marginal tax rate for individual income tax is also very, very high. So, uh, and therefore, uh, for enterprises, especially for uh, private enterprises, uh, it's very difficult for them to pay the taxes according to the law because it means they will make no they they will not make no profit right so in in the last few years we heard lots of news about the uh, thing of like the movie stars or like this uh, how to say this uh, like wang hong zhubo right so they are uh, penalized for evading taxes illegally like so some of them are punished very very badly like uh, wei ya in hangzhou was punished for like like mil uh, Hundred or millions, right? So it's kind of like a, so they are evading taxes. Uh, so uh, so on the one hand, the nominal tax rate is very high, but at the same time, the administration or the enforcement of taxation is very uh, discretional, right? So therefore, the tax officers they have the discretional power to tax you higher or lower. And thirdly, uh, in China. By design, the tax regime is a target regime, right? So, uh, so it means, for example, for the county of uh, one river, which I studied in, uh, they needed to meet the 
tax target set by higher level government. And the, as a nation, uh, the, the central government will set uh, uh, different targets, right? So, uh, so if you watch the uh, watch the uh, Lianghui, like the, the, the National People's Congress, uh, you will find the prime minister will say, okay, so this year we will have GDP growth rate of 6%, and we will have tax revenue growth rate 8%, right? So this is the target for the central government. And then the target will be disaggregated to province, pro provinces. Provinces will disaggregate to lower level government. At the end, uh, each taxation bureau will get their tax target. Okay, so they need to meet their tax. So their task is to meet their tax target, but not to collect the tax revenue according to the law. So this is a kind of very tricky, and this is why I call this is uh, the the tax tax administration is under institutionalized. Uh, so more and more private entrepreneurs they are becoming members of uh, people's congress, uh, people's political consultant conferences, and even the parties committee. Uh, so they are paying on the one hand they are paying taxes, lots of taxes, and on the other hand they are becoming representatives, right? So, but, uh, and there are uh, some interesting studies uh, telling this kind of story. But if we go a step further, and we will find that uh, these representatives, they try to build patron clientelism rather than try to represent or just simply be co-optative. And one important reason is that, uh, uh, so this is similar to uh, Hou Yue's uh, book, Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, Hou book, the private sector in public office, right? So these private entrepreneurs, they become, uh, they get a public office uh, because they have their personal interest and especially for select, selective property rights protection. And taxation is one very important uh, dimension of uh, protecting, you, pro protecting your uh, property rights. Uh, okay, yeah, so I, I mentioned about this. So, yeah, and the, so its implication for private entrepreneurs or the capitalists is that uh, uh, on the one hand, you needed to evade the tax, like, or everybody is evading the taxes. Uh, so it's very rampant tax evasion. And the government strategy is selective implementation, right? So they will not punish everybody. Uh, so it's it is called as uh, some scholars call it legal reparation, right? So they selectively punish someone, right? So Fan Bingbing was punished, uh, but maybe not punished for uh, simply for his, her tax evasion, maybe for something different, right? And then uh, Wei Ya was punished, right? But not others. Uh, and I mean, of course, then the uh, many other people they they will uh, try to pay more uh, more taxes, right? Uh, and this somehow institutionally generated fear for this resource uh, rich capitalists. And they know that uh, their best strategy is to get a patronage, uh, get a, a patron to protect him or her rather than challenge the party state. Right? So if you try to challenge the party state, then you will be in trouble. Uh, so for example, Ai Weiwei, who's like a very famous uh, artist, but also at the same time, a political dissent and he was arrested, and then when when the for, uh, when when uh, many international forces asked him the Chinese government, so what happened to him? Uh, and then the the reply came from a uh, office a uh, tax officer. Uh, he's evading huge amount of taxes. So we do we arrest him according to the law, right? So this is like a very ideal tool for legal reparation. So again, according to Machiavelli, so a ruler is better to be feared than, I mean, it, uh, so you need to both be feared and be loved. But if it's difficult to have both, then you choose be feared rather than be loved, right? Uh, and in a paper I published in uh, a few years ago in 2019, I further uh, distinguish this Cooperation via privilege and the cooperation via deterrence. Uh, so this is the strategy uh, that the party state can use. 
Okay, now, okay, I, spend, uh, I quickly uh, conclude. So by doing this, by, reveal, uh, by telling what the tax day transition in China is and how these three different uh, dimensions of tax state contributes to uh, both governing and ruling, right? Uh, I try to build uh, an endogenous institutional explain, uh, explanation of authoritarian resilience. Uh, so uh, I, and I find that uh, uh, legal repression could be a very important pattern of domination. It's, it's different, it's very different from uh, uh, repression, coercive repression. And I also try to build uh, how, uh, by using these uh, two dilemmas, gross dilemma and representation dilemma and the three mechanisms, I also try to build how uh, the party and the taxation institutions uh, influence each other in a circular way. It's not a one direction uh, causal explanation. And I also did some historical comparison uh, and uh, some uh, close national comparison. I tried to test the, the external validity of my argument. And uh, uh, conceptually, I also tried to discuss the difference between especially legal repression and forbearance. And I also tried to compare with the rightful resistance. So because uh, so, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to the details. Yes, so uh, to, uh, to conclude, uh, this half tax state under institutionalized tax administration and the de facto fiscal federalism uh, helps to maintain the regime uh, through these three functions. Uh, but the, the, the solid line means like they are positive to, or they improve these mechanisms, but the negative ones imply that they have some negative effects on this uh, on these functions. So therefore, uh, in different time period, their functions could be different. And as I mentioned at the beginning, in the last 40 years, maybe this institution, this tax state are more positive than negative. But we don't know whether in the coming years, whether uh, it will be the true. And whether, as Deng Xiaoping mentioned, some kind of political reform is necessary to keep the fluids of economic reform. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Zhang. That, that, that is a very uh, clear explanation of what uh, it, it was a very scholarly uh, piece of work. Uh, so now uh, maybe I could invite Professor Angela Zhang to give some comments uh, on the book, on the presentation. Um, okay, Angela, so, please. Uh, it... Yes, thank you, um, Professor Zhang. It's a Great pleasure to have the opportunity to discuss your book here. Um, and I actually read the book before I was asked to um, discuss the book. Um, and then when I was reading it, um, a lot of the things uh, really resonate with my own research, uh, which is also about uh, governance. Although I focus more on law, um, most of the most specifically on regulatory governance, although law is just, you know, in China is very closely related to policy. And I find your, uh, the dichotomy between uh, ruling and governance very fascinating. Um, and, um, but but it's it's also intuitive and, and, and I, I definitely um, agree with that. So uh, my remark is actually quite brief. Um, I, first of all, I want to congratulate on the book. I mean, I, I've read a lot of books. I read at least one book a, a, a week and I read mostly China book. And your book is uh, really one of the best I have read um, this year. So I'm very excited and recommend it to my colleagues. And mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, I, I, I don't really come, don't often come across a book that make me feel very excited. Um, the reason why I feel excited um, is uh, the following reasons. First, I think it's an important book and it's a very, uh, it actually addressed a very timely topic and a topic that I, I care a lot about. And so I first discuss why this book is important. And second, I would say why this book is really good. And third, what I think, you know, I offer a little bit critique of the book. And lastly, I will ask you a couple of questions, some thoughts about what's happening uh, in, in China right now. 
so why do I think the book is really important? Um, it the book is a very broad addresses a very broad and ambitious topic on why China regime has achieved resilience. I mean, this topic is actually, you know, it's a very crowded field. I mean, as, as you laid out just now, I mean, there's a lot of scholars, political scientists, sociologists, uh, economists of trying to address this topic. And you're trying to tackle this through the angle of tax, and which is hugely important, right? I mean, it, and, um, and, and the reason why the book is so important because it's very relevant to our current debate about income inequality. And, and this is a big question, not just facing um, China, but actually all over the world, right? I mean, including United States and Europe, which has been a hugely important topic. And in other countries, you will see, you know, taxes are one of the main instruments uh, for government to address income inequality. But uh, funny enough, when our government uh, promotes the so-called common, init common prosperity initiative, tax is actually not playing a prominent role um, in, in this debate. Rather, what we are seeing is very active regulatory enforcement against tech firms, um, uh, some informal pressures on the rich people to donate, um, and to invest in socially uh, beneficial projects and to achieve some redistributions through kind of informal institutions and some coercive means, uh, repressive uh, regula regulations, right? We, we, we are not seeing much tax going on. And that's why when Barry Norton was discussing um, China's tech crackdown, he was like one of the big puzzles, like, look, I understand where you guys are coming from. I, I understand there's this income inequality problem and China's Gini coefficient is approaching that of the United States. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. But why don't you address this through proper tax reform? And so when I read your book, um, you know, one of the mechanisms that you explain is that, you know, inherently, China cannot do that because of the it's a half tax state. I mean, it relies very heavily on non-tax revenue. And, and the government don't want um, to, you know, to, to don't want to uh, increase, directly increase uh, yeah. the taxes for the representation problem. And, and that gets me thinking, okay, so it looks like they are trying to solve the easy problem, um, you know, trying to, seems to be doing something without tackling the real problem here. Well, the real problem is that you need to go through this fundamental tax reform to address the income inequality problem, which is serious in China. And so, and, and that answers a very big question, right? I mean, what 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 are these superficial things that they're doing is only scratching the surface without dialing the more difficult problem. And it looks like, you know, if you look at, you know, this reform, it looks like they're very uh, decisive, very determined, very harsh, but, you know, it's it's not addressing the real problem here. And And from what you have told me, it looks like it's difficult to be addressed. I mean, fundamental may never be addressed. And, 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 and so that's the first thing. And um, the second thing is why, why I think this book is so good. I mean, um, the, the author mostly take a institutional approach and give us a very realistic picture of incentives that are driving um, the, the bureaucracy um, and, and the regulatory authorities. And among these three mechanisms, um, my favorite one is the third one about the under institutionalization of the tax system. And when we study, uh, when the legal scholars study uh, Chinese uh, administrative law, uh, we we encounter similar problem. We we also find under institutionalization of these uh, regulators. But one of our uh, one of our major explanations for that is that the state does not want a very strong bureaucracy um, because you know if the bureaucracy the, the regulators are so professionalized and so independent then that will kind of you know take away their loyalty because at the end of the day you know the political loyalty comes first before um, professionalism so that's one of the reasons. We think, I mean, I used to think why China does not want to grow a very powerful, um, a very strong and very resourceful uh, bureaucratic state. 
um, it, it, because because it's, it's easier to control a smaller uh, and less professionalized uh, bureaucracy. Um, and, and but but the tax authority is fascinating. That um, is actually uh, one of the ways because you simply cannot tax everybody uh, is actually facilitate growth. And I found that explanation uh, uh, really interesting and you've done a, a, a tremendous amount of field work. So I really could owe that effort. So now it comes to my little critique. Um, I actually think that you make the absolutely the right decision to change your um, title at the very last minute. The reason is because I think um, on the one hand, the three mechanisms that you 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 laid out here do seems to, uh, you know, support some of the resilience of the Chinese regime. But for me, when I was reading it, it, it reveals more of its fragility, right? Because um, when you talk about, you know, the first uh, one, it's about uh, the regional uh, uh, competition among these governments. Um, this is about how to grow the tax revenue. And China relied very heavily on this kind of growth. And particularly in the past few decades, uh, the local government relied very heavily on um, this excessive um, infrastructure growth, which is mostly subsidized by land sales. And, and that have created a lot of long-term uh, problems in the Chinese uh, economic structure. And that's why the government now want to tackle a lot of the property, uh, you know, throughout the past two decades, they repeatedly intervened in the property market. They're trying to do something about it, they cannot. And, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Um, and every time they come in and there is massive bleeding, they have to stop it. And, and we basically go through this again and again, right? I mean, so, so that's what I see the fragility with the first mechanism. And the second mechanism is about a non tax state and um, half tax state, right? I mean, we already talked about that because China is at a stage of, seriously, we need to tackle income inequality, but now um, because of this unique tax regime, um, it's hard to, to deal with that, right? I mean, so again, the government is faced another huge dilemma. And, and lastly, when you talk about the under institutionalization of uh, the tax system, um, it, it actually, you know, further adds to people's uh, you know, skepticisms and and disbelief and and this confident <laughs> lack of confidence uh, in the Chinese uh, legal system, right? I mean, because uh, how we perceive cases against Wei Ya, cases against Fan Bingbing, I mean, it, it it just and and now you know if you don't like a Ai Weiwei, you know, you go after him using tax. I, I mean, it just adds to the you know people who have less credibility. Uh, in, in faith in the Chinese uh, legal system, right? I mean, so all three mechanisms, I, I think, you know, adds to the fragility uh, of the Chinese uh, regime. So, um, and, and I don't know how, you know, maybe at, at, at a certain stage, particularly now, it's become, becoming more fragile than ever. And, 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 and we might, you know, uh, go into a, a kind of a very dangerous uh, uh, situation right now. Look at what, how China is battling with COVID and, and the property crisis. Now, and, the, and my last comment is some questions and some thoughts I would really love to hear from you um, since you're a huge tax expert and know <laughs> very little. But I really care about this. Um, and you already addressed some of this in your book about the China's property Price, uh, property uh, tax reform. Um, there's a, some talk, you know, around last year that China is going to introduce um, property tax. Um, and and at the beginning, they want to do it um, on a wider base, but later there's some people objected that they want to limit into 10 cities. And now this whole thing seems to be suspended. Um, and, you know, I have no idea how this is going to first lead to any sort of substantive progress uh, and, and change uh, to the China's tax system, to, either to add to its fragility or its resilience, I don't know, and um, and and how feasible it is to ever do that, right? I mean, and, and the second is another very big problem is how is China going to tax its ultra-rich people? 
And um, as you as you mentioned, right, China's uh, tax uh, income tax rate is very high already, actually forty five something, and and it's also progressive. Um, but the rich people, the really rich people like Jack Ma and, and you know all these people, most of the assets are not in China. They're in Cayman Island. They're in in tax havens, um, and it's really hard to tax those assets. So, like, I mean, they are, the real tax rate of these people are really low. So the Chinese government is faced with, you know, if I'm the Chinese government, I would be scratching my head. Um, how can I tax these people without coercing them to donate? Because mm -hmm. these assets are really out of my reach. Um, and, and, you know, I, I can see where the Chinese government is coming from by nudging them or you know, threatening them to donate um, and to do something for a society because really they, they can't do anything about these assets that are overseas. And, and, they're, they're, and they have very sophisticated lawyers and bankers in Hong Kong to help them set up trusts and funds to evade tax, right? I mean, so I really don't know, you know, because this is a really important part of wealth uh, coming out of China and that stay out of the scrutiny of the Chinese government. I don't know whether you have uh, thought about this and, and that could share some thoughts with us. Uh, but again, congratulations on this really important work. I truly enjoyed it and I recommend everybody to buy the copy. Um, it's not expensive and that's one of, also one of the reasons why I buy it. <laughs> and, and, and I thought it's really thought provoking. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Angela. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, so, Okay, so uh, yeah, I think you. Uh, okay, so I will accept both your uh, congratulations and your critics. Uh, so, uh, so for the critics, I think uh, yes. Uh, so actually, the the the, the tax state is shows more and more fragility in recent years, especially in the last three years, and uh, uh, so I think your comment really makes me uh, feel uh, released, uh, relieved because uh, I was always like uh, uh, like uh, like uh, wondering like whether I should change uh, the subtitle of the book and uh, you gave, gave me a very very good reason uh, to uh, switch to the current subtitle yeah so it's not only because of its, uh, like political sensitive but also because it's more uh, uh, kind of like can, can, it has more external validity in the long term right so 10 years later or 20 years later when people read the book they find okay so it's not a joke because it's not talking about the resilience it's, it's also implies for the fluidability uh, uh, okay so thank you for uh, so and i i think your critics are very uh, uh are very good and i uh and i take uh, all of them and we i think about that uh I mentioned some of them in the book, but not very ex explicitly or in syst uh, systematic way. So, uh, and for the for the questions, uh, yeah, I think these two are very good questions, and uh, I did try to touch the topic, but I uh, didn't go deep. So, for the property tax reform, uh, so there, there is a, a, a very interesting research by uh, conducted by a PhD candidate. Uh, of uh, Berk uh, the sociology department in Berkeley. So John Yuan John Yuan has a, a paper published in Theory and the Society, and he studies uh, the Shanghai and the Chongqing, like how these two different modes of uh, uh, pro uh, property tax uh, were initiated. And his explanation is uh, it was initiated because of uh, political competition, uh, especially for long, like, at the very top level, right? So it's uh, it's not because the party or the government wants to collect the revenue. It's more about uh, uh, the political competition among two uh, Politburo members who wants to uh, further get into the standing committee. So like he, and he uh, got a very interesting and uh, some inner information about uh, this story and also well, uh, theoretically very well framed. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and this, this, so actually I'm not a real expert on this property tax reform, uh, 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 this property tax reform. Uh, so I, I, could not tell a full story about that. That's why I didn't didn't write it in the book. Uh, but it, it will be interesting to explore uh, further. Uh, 
And for how to tax the rich people. So this is another very, very interesting topic. And uh, so one of my colleagues, uh, he talked to me because uh, he, uh, he got his PhD from uh, Northwestern. And uh, uh, Jeffrey Winters uh, is, is, uh, was on his committee. So Jeffrey Winters has uh, the book Oligarchy. And the Oligarchy mainly studies how uh, rich people, especially in the United States, but also in other uh, developed democracies uh, try to pro uh, they successfully protect their wealth from uh, the tax, especially from the taxation regime. Right? So, so my colleague asked me whether, invited me whether I can work with him and with uh, Jeffrey Winters to write uh, like a, a paper on oligarch Chinese oligarchies. And then like I, 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 I can't I reject it as an invitation mostly because um, most of my field work uh, rely on like a small and medium sized enterprises, not at this like very uh, high level, uh, this like a very large uh, enterprises. So they have, and I'm glad that I can't, I couldn't get any reliable information from these very super rich people, right? So, but they are working on a paper on Chinese oligarchy, like they try to study how Chinese rich people protect their wealth uh, from, uh, and of course, the taxation system in China is very different from the United States, right? Uh, and the and it's, it's also changing more rapidly than the United United uh, tax tax uh, taxation system. So therefore, maybe they will find something uh, more interesting. But for me, like uh, like I am afraid of doing such a kind of <laughs> research because I can't do uh, collect very reliable information on this. Yeah, but these are very good uh, uh, questions. And uh, also very good comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Chang. So we are at time actually, but I, I do actually want to ask another question since since we have you here. You know, when when reading the book, you know, because I can't help but think of this distinction that Robert Merton made between uh, latent functions and manifest functions. And I think the idea is that manifest functions uh, are. are you know, institutions serve these functions and they do so on purpose, right? They were designed to serve these particular functions. Mm -hmm. And latent functions are functions that are served by institutions, you know, incidentally, right? The, the institutions were not designed or, or, or conceived uh, to, mm -hmm. to serve these functions, but nevertheless they do, right? And so there's this distinction that's sometimes drawn uh, when talking about institutions between manifest and latent functions. And so, so, so when I was reading the book, you know, I was wondering, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense and the evidence you present is very compelling, but you know, are some of these functions in a sense latent, right? In the sense that, you know, the, the aspects of the text of the, of, the, of the fiscal state you're talking about, they're not really designed, you know, to solve a particular dilemma. They're not really designed to create this effect, but they do and, 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 and somehow it has just sustained itself that way. I, w I wonder if, if you know, uh, the, the kind of account you're giving is one where there is this kind of purposeful a uh, very kind of intentional design of the fiscal state to fulfill, you know, for, to solve, for example, the growth dilemma or, or the representation dilemma, or it, it so happens, right, that these institutions somehow evolve and now they serve these functions in, in a more latent way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, uh, yeah, this, thank you. This is a very important question. And uh, actually, uh, I, uh, I I was inspired by, uh, by uh, reading some actually uh, blog blog article uh, by the guy who went to Chongqing, uh, so the, uh, Li Zhuang, so the lawyer who went to Chongqing and then he was arrested and uh, and stayed in jail for like years, years or months. And then when he came out, uh, uh, he like uh, he says uh, he he wrote many articles and one his uh, in one of them he said that uh, so the. The legal system in China is uh, is to uh, to re legislate the laws very strictly or set a very high standard, uh, but and then uh, they enforce the law very loosen in a very loosen way. But they selectively uh, punish somebody, right? So it's like uh, uh, So like so when I read the. Uh, the, uh, read this sentence, I kind of like I was shocked, and I think okay, so this this is the logic I want to uh, I want to kind of like uh, apply, right? So uh, so this actually uh, so and 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 for the tech for the taxation, 
uh, at the beginning, I didn't think about this uh, uh, the, this function this function that, that was designed or not designed uh, by the policy makers. And I just mentioned, okay, so the the nominal tax rate is very high, therefore everybody is or most people is evading taxes. And then on a conference, uh, one colleague asked me the question. So do you mean that the party intentionally designed it? Uh, and then I said, no, I'm not sure. But I knew, and then I checked with some uh, uh, some, uh, some scholars and they told me, okay, so you need to check. Uh, so you need to, uh, I mean, this is what uh, uh, the his, his historical institutional reason would will do, right? So you need to go back and find out what happened at the beginning. So I checked I I checked uh, what happened in uh, 1993 when the tax year reform was implemented. And then I found that uh, at the same time, the rationale is very was very, very simple. Okay, so and this was also remarked by the first uh, first head of the uh, national tax builder uh, Jin Xin. So in his uh, in his uh, doc, uh, his collection uh, 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 he said that okay, so the state council asked us to uh, submit this amount of revenue. Okay, so we need to meet this target. Uh, okay, so not let let us calculate. So we get this tax base, and uh, this tax base is hard to tax. We can only tax like a full uh, like a like a twenty percent or thirty percent of this tax base. And then now let's do the mathematics. So how we should we should say said higher tax rate. Therefore, even with this huge amount of tax evasion, we can still meet our target. Okay, so at the beginning, it's, I mean, the policy design was was just to meet the tax target. I mean, especially for for these tax builders. I mean, they are kind of like they are professional builders, right? So they they their their task is to meet the tax ta tax revenue, right? So uh, and when taxation is used politically, it's not. The tax builders, right? So the local politicians or the uh, politicians at the national level. Okay, so they designed the they they set the uh, tax rates at their time, and then uh, later on there are some minor uh, adjustments. But but it had this uh, what a, a historical institutionalism would say unintended consequence. Why right? the unintended consequence is that. Uh, 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 I mean, the intended consequences, people are evading taxes, but they still can collect that amount of revenue. Uh, but then the, the uh, government's taxation capacity has been improved very significantly in the last uh, two or three, uh, three decades, right? With, uh, there are more and more uh, tax officers. They are equipped with uh, the most recent IT technology and so on, right? So now, uh, they can tax it very easily, uh, especially compared to 20 or 30 years ago. But the tax rates were not adjusted uh, that, that, um, uh, that much. So therefore, there, this is uh, the institute, but then the institution could be used for uh, as, a, uh, as a purposes. And this is what uh, Angela just mentioned. So for other government regulations, it also uh, implies. And, I, and so there's a, uh, there's a scholar in Johns Hopkins University, who study the Ford regulation in China, and he finds similar logic. So the standards are very high, but the enforcement is very weak. So yeah, so it's kind of like a a, a common logic. But uh, I I would say it's uh, it's too bold to claim that uh, the the party institution uh, intentionally designed this as a, a tool for legal regulation. Thank you. That's very interesting, Professor Zhang. So uh, we are now at 10 o'clock in Hong Kong and, and uh, 10 a.m. in uh, Boston. So I think we've tortured you long enough <laughs> uh, and, and, and we should let you go. Uh, so thank you everyone so much uh, for joining this book talk. I learned a lot. Uh, I'm sure you did too. Uh, and as uh, Professor Angela, Angela Zhang said, please buy the book. It's cheap. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's not an easy read, I have to admit. It's, it's very scholarly, but it's, it's definitely very rewarding. Uh, so I definitely recommend it to all of you. All right, so thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.